Hello, everyone. This is Stacey Purcell of the Vet Recruiter, and I'd like to welcome you to this special webinar about reinventing your veterinary career. I'm the owner and the founder of the Vet Recruiter and a certified personnel consultant, and this is my 19th year in recruiting, and most of those years have been spent in the animal health and veterinary space. I've worked with thousands of veterinarians and animal health professionals and placed many candidates in both practice and in industry. Joining me today is our special guest, Dr. Karen Felstead, the founder and president of Panthera T, a management consulting firm that works exclusively with veterinary practices and with companies in the animal health world that provide pharmaceuticals, dietary products, and business services to veterinary practices. Dr. Felstead is a veterinarian and a CPA. She has a marketing degree and spent 12 years in accounting and business management, including six years with what is now Ernst & Young. She has a master's degree in management and administrative science, and after graduating from Texas A&M with her DVM degree, she practiced both small and emergency medicine full-time while maintaining an accounting and consulting practice. She later became manager in charge of a national public accounting firm specializing in tax accounting and practice management service for veterinarians. She was the Chief Executive Officer for the National Commission on Veterinary Economic Issues, and she now does business consulting with private practices and the animal health industry. Karen was given the Western Veterinary Conference Practice Management Continuing Educator of the Year Award, and in 2014 was awarded the Vet Partners Distinguished Life Membership Award. She is a founding member of Vet Partners and is a current member of the Veterinary Economics Editorial Advisory Board. She is also a certified veterinary practice manager. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to welcome you to submit questions as we go through the GoToWebinar interface. Just type your question in the chat window for organizer and panelist only, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar. We've got a full house today. There's a lot of people on this call. It looks like most of you are veterinarians in private practice, but we've also got a number of veterinarians who have joined us who are working in industry and some other non-veterinarian professionals who are working in industry as well. And then we also have a few aspiring veterinarians on the call today who are interested in learning about career opportunities in veterinary industry. Today's webinar is geared towards veterinarians who would like to know what opportunities are out there besides private practice and how to land some of these opportunities. Many of you may be reading industry journals and looking online and noticing ads for positions within your area of expertise outside of practice in the veterinary industry. And this might cause you to stop and pause for a second because you enjoy practice or perhaps you've always wondered what else is out there. Today's webinar is uh, broken down into three sections. What types of jobs are available in industry? What qualifications are needed for those jobs? And how to transition into the corporate world? Keeping in mind uh, these three sections, we have two main teaching objectives for today's webinar. We are going to describe the skills needed to transition from private practice to the corporate environment, and we're going to explore opportunities currently available outside of traditional clinical practice. Let's start with some of the opportunities that are available to veterinarians outside of private practice. We have identified six main areas outside of practice, and those areas include the following. Government, academia, military, nonprofit organizations and associations, and then also industry. And for the purpose of today's webinar, we're going to focus specifically on opportunities in veterinary industry. Before we go further, let's define what is the veterinary industry. The veterinary industry is comprised of companies that make products or offer services for pet owners and for veterinarians. There is a wide array of companies that operate within the industry, and that means there are a number of employment opportunities that are available to you. The types of companies within industry include pharmaceutical manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers, medical equipment companies, companies that sell medical supplies, pet food companies, and also companies that sell insurance for pets laboratory and diagnostic service companies, and companies that sell laboratory supplies and equipment. Keep in mind that veterinarians are hired in almost every business that makes, provides, or sells these types of products or services. Let's talk about why, why are veterinarians interested in leaving practice to go work in industry. 
Uh, some are looking for a new challenge. They want to broaden their skill base. Uh, sometimes they become disillusioned. They thought that practice could be more fulfilling than it is, and now they would like to seek something else. Sometimes they have allergies and they're no longer able to be around animals on a daily basis. Sometimes they become injured and can no longer practice, and that is more common with large animal veterinarians. Other reasons are partial retirement. They're looking for better compensation or better benefits, better quality of life, or more flexibility. The reason that you're seeking to leave private practice is important, so it's not something that you should dismiss or overlook. And keep this in mind, the companies want to hire people who have a positive reason for change, such as they're looking for a greater opportunity or a greater challenge, or they want to move to the business side. On the other hand, companies are not looking for people who just want to escape practice or are running away from something. They want to hire candidates who are motivated for the right reason, so it should be a positive reason in order to want to make a change. There are a couple things that you should consider when thinking about making a move to industry. First of all, the transition may require you to be further away from working with animals, and this is something that a lot of veterinarians haven't taken the time to consider. If you love working with animals, it's definitely something that should be a part of your decision-making process. Secondly, while you might be tempted to think that you're wasting your veterinary school degree because you're not in practice, you may actually have the opportunity to impact more animals by working in industry instead. It all comes down to what is most important to you, and once you know what those reasons are, then you can make sound decisions regarding your career. To help illustrate this last point, I'd like to use a quote from Dr. Dan Green, a veterinarian in industry. Dr. Green said the following, I realized I could do more good and help more animals by spreading the information about new treatments in veterinary medicine than I had done in 18 years of emergency veterinary medicine. I test so many veterinarians and hopefully inspire them to do better quality of medicine. What I'll be doing in today's presentation is presenting the different categories of job opportunities that are available to you in industry. First, I'll talk about each one, and then I will discuss some of the specific jobs that are included within those categories. Those categories are professional or technical services, pharmacovigilance, regulatory affairs, sales and marketing, liaison or cross-functional positions, business development, and research in development. Let's start with the first category on our list, which is professional services. Employment opportunities exist within professional services for different species of animals, which of course include companion animal, equine, beef cattle, dairy cattle, poultry, and swine. What are the duties involved with positions in professional services? Some of those duties include providing product information to veterinarians, presenting seminars to sales staff and practicing veterinarians, speaking about an organization's products or services, providing technical support to marketing, providing technical training, or writing with sales reps. But what about some of the characteristics and requirements of these jobs? First of all, you should know that these jobs in professional services typically require at least five years of private practice experience. And professional services is a good transition point from practice to industry, and sometimes you can advance to other jobs and continue to develop your career. It's actually the most common point where I see veterinarians transition from practice to industry. Do keep in mind that there is typically heavy travel associated with these positions. In fact, you might be traveling up to 75 or 80 percent of the time. But the good news is that in many cases you can secure a company car or at least a car allowance. Different organizations call professional services by different titles, including technical services or veterinary services manager. This is an actual job that a company posted for a veterinary services manager. And there were four main responsibilities that the person in this position has. They position the organization as a leader among the academic community and practicing veterinarians. They provide technical training and development in the areas of sales and distribution. They assist with calling on key accounts and delivery of technical presentations. And this is an actual job that our firm was hired to fill. 
And so the qualifications that this company requested were a veterinary degree, an MBA, advanced training, or they preferred board certification. They wanted two to five years of private practice experience and a current veterinary license. It was preferred but not required for them to have one to, two, three, to, one to three years in industry. In addition, they were looking for someone that had one to three years of public speaking experience, and they were also looking for sales, communication, and marketing experience. People in this position should possess excellent communication skills, presentation skills, and be computer literate. And as we talked about earlier, there is a lot of travel with these positions. And this particular position requires up to 80% travel, including overnights and weekends. Another example of a technical services position that I filled for one of our clients was a specialty account veterinarian. The main responsibilities in this role were for the incumbent to make sales calls and sales presentations to boarded veterinary specialists in specialty referral hospitals throughout a particular region. And the qualifications that this client requested for the position included a DVM or related degree, plus profit and loss responsibility, and they wanted somebody who could sell to boarded specialists, and then part of that uh, they also wanted the person to be outgoing and confident. And travel is also a consideration because this position required 75% travel, and much of that was overnight. So we talk about 75% travel. That could be three to four, could be five nights uh, every week. The next category of employment opportunity that we're going to talk about today is pharmacovigilance. A veterinarian who works in pharmacovigilance typically handles complaints about a product and then follows up on those complaints. This includes handling the reporting and tracking of these complaints and working with regulatory agencies on the reporting. And here is an actual job description for a pharmacovigilance veterinarian on the next slide. Um, and then one thing I also wanted to point out is in, in these pharmacovigilance positions, these veterinarians are typically working in an office setting at a desk, um, on the phone, and on a computer. And they typically work in a database. The most common one is called PV Works, And that allows them to track the reporting and the follow through of the complaints. So here's a job description of a position that we filled for a pharmacovigilance veterinarian. They review adverse event and product defect claims for accuracy, completeness, and consistency prior to being submitted to the regulatory affairs group. They also apply their knowledge to the pharmacovigilance practices and assist with the formation of assessments in adverse event cases and ensure those assessments are included in the case report. They work closely with regulatory affairs and quality assurance to analyze the trending results, and they communicate those results internally within their organization. And they also assist regulatory affairs and quality assurance in the generation of product reviews for submission, and they work closely with and assist the field technical services veterinarians. In terms of the qualifications for this particular role that we filled for a pharmacovigilance veterinarian, this particular employer was looking for a DVM degree or equivalent. They were looking for five years of private practice clinical experience, a valid license to practice veterinary medicine in the United States. They wanted uh, one year of pharmacovigilance experience, but they were also willing to consider veterinarians right out of practice. And then somebody who had an understanding of companion animal veterinary medicine and equine and livestock experience. And then somebody who has knowledge of US regulations and related to post-marketing product safety. And typically, with pharmacovigilance positions, there's, there's not as much travel as with a field technical services position. Uh, this position only required 5% travel and then possibly occasional international travel. So this is another area where I have seen veterinarians transition from directly from private practice uh, to industry. And these positions are especially good for people who are not interested in traveling extensively. Um, it does require a certain person to be able to be on the phone all day, uh, mostly listening to complaints. You have to have the right kind of personality to be able to calm people down and, uh, and be able to settle them down. And then you have to have good follow through skills as well. So our third category of job opportunities we're going to talk about today is regulatory affairs. 
And typically, in regulatory affairs, uh, this person would be in charge of communications with the appropriate regulatory agency, which would include the FDA, the EPA, the USDA, or sometimes foreign regulatory agencies. And sometimes these jobs are broken down into US regulatory affairs and international regulatory affairs. So you'll have some people that are working with the US regulatory agencies. And then you'll have your international regulatory affairs that are working with regulatory bodies in other foreign countries outside of the US. And a regulatory affairs manager would take a new drug concept to the FDA and they would negotiate with the agency about the work that needs to get done in order to get that drug approved. And here is an actual job that our company was hired to fill for a senior regulatory affairs manager. And we're going to look at the responsibilities of this position. So these professionals typically handle regulatory goals through interactions with federal and state regulatory agencies. They ensure that all products receive regulatory approval, and they handle any post-approval regulatory issues that might arise. In addition, they provide input on strategic planning related to regulatory issues. And as far as qualifications, uh, this company was looking for an advanced scientific degree, and typically a DVM or a PhD and also seven to 10 years of experience in industry, and three of those years in a leadership role. So this position would typically not be a position that somebody would uh, leave practice and come right into. This would be a position that somebody would have already been working in industry for a number of years and would have received some cross-training within their current organization. So the fourth category of job opportunities that we're going to talk about today is sales and marketing. And for the overview of this category, I'm going to break it up into two parts, first sales and then marketing. A person in sales typically would travel to potential buyers, in our case that is most often veterinary clinics, and they present product information and they take orders. So it makes sense that those in this role are well suited to working with people and are comfortable with traveling. A person in a sales role must also have persuasive skills to convince the other party to buy their products and services. Um, and they really take on more of a consultative role where they have to know the, um, how the products work and what they do and the features and the benefits of those products so they can explain how the products work to the customer, the potential customer, and, and then convince them to buy the product. And then on the marketing side, these professionals present a company's products and services, typically to the veterinary profession, but it could also be uh, to, to pet owners. You could be marketing directly to pet owners, too. And this could include advertising, working with ad agencies, promotions, um, PR firms, doing presentations. And marketing positions require some travel. It's typically not as much as sales. On average, marketing roles tend to involve about 25% travel. So this is a uh, position that our company was hired to fill in sales. And the title of this position was a specialty sales representative for swine and bovine. And the primary responsibilities of this role were to promote and sell products in the US market, set up and perform product demonstrations, sometimes at trade shows, and build relationships with key opinion leaders. And they would also provide technical support and respond to customer complaints. And as we discussed, there is travel involved with a position like this, both domestic and international travel. As far as the qualifications that this company requested, they did want a DVM degree. They wanted experience in herd production and knowledge of the United States swine and or bovine market, because some of these roles uh, require multiple species knowledge, and then some are just one specific species. Um, the second position that we are going to look at within the sales and marketing category is a senior technical services veterinarian of marketing. And while this it, it is kind of a combination, if you will, technical services and marketing position, this particular role didn't fall under tech services within this organization. It actually fell into the marketing department. So this position is a more senior level role and has more responsibilities and requires more qualifications. So in this role, the person would collaborate with the manager of technical services. They would review marketing material for technical accuracy and appropriateness. They would devise marketing and advertising strategies, promote products for medical and technical accuracy, represent the company at industry events and trade shows, 
develop technical product profiles and participate in the technical aspects of product positioning. This person would also act as a medical authority in two ways. They would write scientific articles and make presentations and also assist in technical product training. So this particular position, we filled it with a veterinarian who had a number of years of industry experience, um, primarily in technical services, uh, but she also had some marketing and, and some R&D in her background. So the responsibilities uh, with this position were to review national animal health conditions, advise senior management of specific requirements, and, rate and make recommendations regarding present and future needs, collaborate with the manager to aid in networking with key opinion leaders in the animal health industry through veterinary organizations and technical associations, and then to help represent the company at technical associations and events, and to keep abreast of scientific and political changes and help to influence change and also to advise senior management. So the qualifications needed for this position for the technical services veterinarian marketing included a DVM degree or equivalent, five years of clinical practice experience, and at least three years of industry experience. They also wanted business experience, uh, understanding of disease control and animal requirements, ability to develop prevention programs, strong organizational and communication skills, and they should also have the ability to analyze research, diagnose serious animal health problems, and develop appropriate prevention programs. Our fifth category of employment opportunities within the industry is liaison or cross-functional positions. And before we look at a specific position in its category, we're going to look at some of the trends that exist in this section of industry. These positions are typically found in larger organizations, and they involve veterinarians who serve as a link or a bridge within a number of disciplines, including sales, marketing, research and development, technical services, and the executive function. And as a result, candidates for this position must be veterinarians with a strong background in business management and organizational skills. And as you would expect, they would have strong people skills. And this would not be an entry-level position from practice to industry. This would be a position somebody would cross-train and uh, develop into later in their career as they've been in industry for a while. One of the specific jobs we're going to look at is a position that our company filled called a marketing liaison veterinarian. And the person in this role is responsible for the support of companion animal products and that includes marketing strategies, product communications and technical support, interfacing with research and development and marketing to develop marketing support trials, and also to serve as a resource for the pharmacovigilance department in the handling of difficult cases. In addition, they discuss and report adverse reactions, efficacy problems, and formulation complaints, and they prepare and deliver technical lectures. They attend trade shows and develop key opinion leader support, and they're responsible for alerting the business regarding emergency disease, diseases, emerging diseases, and new trends. And then once again, since this position has so many responsibilities, there are quite a few requirements and qualifications that are necessary. Uh, first of all, they need a DVM degree and at least three years of private practice experience and three to five years of industry experience. Uh, specifically, they need expertise and key focus in immunology, vaccinology, and shelter medicine and or diabetes. They need to have excellent communication skills, including verbal, written, and listening skills, as well as good presentation skills, and need to be able to work with cross-functional teams and be able to travel 30 to 50 percent of the time. We're now up to our sixth category of employment opportunities, which is business development. As far as responsibilities for jobs in this category, people in business development typically look for potential new products and they make deals with other companies. Specifically, they foster relationships and negotiate deals with companies both in the U.S. and also abroad. In terms of business development, a business degree is typical and a technical background is necessary and the person would need to have a track record in business development uh, typically uh, some type of leadership experience, and then in this case, a human or veterinary pharmaceutical degree is required, 
and most often they want veterinary experience. This would not be an entry level role from practice to industry. These are typically roles that uh, people that would have been in industry for a period of time would, would move into later on in their career. So the last of the seven categories we're going to talk about today is research and development. And keep in mind, this is an area that you might want to explore if you still want hands-on work with animals and you have an interest in clinical medicine. Many of these positions are open to veterinarians, although some do require advanced training, such as additional degrees, um, often masters, and many of the jobs in R&D do require PhDs. And here is a specific job that our company filled for a pharmaceutical company. It was a manager of clinical development. And in this role, uh, this person would develop and execute comprehensive plans for products in clinical development. They would design and write study protocols and select veterinary investigators to execute clinical trials. They would oversee and monitor studies, which includes writing study reports and interpreting study results and they would prepare submissions to the regulatory agencies, provide support to commercial operations, and present the results of the studies to the scientific community. The qualifications that this company required was a DVM and or a PhD in an animal health related area. They wanted one year of experience in product development within or closely associated to the animal health pharmaceutical industry. And although this is not an absolute necessary, it is a preferred requirement. They should also have good organizational and time management skills, be self-motivated, have good interpersonal skills, and possess the ability to lead and work within and across interdisciplinary teams. And as far as travel is concerned, this position has about 25% travel in the U.S., and then there is also some limited international travel. So this brings us uh, to the end of this portion of the webinar. And you can see some of the current job opportunities and openings uh, like some of these that are posted on our website, which I have posted here. And now in the next part of the webinar, we are going to take a look at some real resumes of real people who, have, who are still working in veterinary industry. And what I want to point out about these resumes that we're going to look at is all of these veterinarians started out in technical services but moved into different areas of the veterinary industry. I've changed the names of these individuals and I've posted a photo, but it's not their real photo. Uh, I've given them fake names to protect their privacy, but these are all people that I know who are currently working in the veterinary industry. The first person that we see here is Dr. Thompson. And Dr. Thompson has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology, and he also has a DVM. He started out his career as an associate veterinarian, and then the point where he transitioned to industry was when he became a consulting veterinarian slash account manager for a pet food company. And then he transitioned to go work for a pharmaceutical company as a professional services veterinarian. In that role, he supported a regional sales team with technical product support and training and management of pharmacovigilance needs. And then he was promoted within that pharmaceutical company and he became the director of the U.S. Professional Services where he led a team of veterinarians who provided technical product support and training for the commercial business. From there, he received from cross-training within his organization, and they moved him into sales where he became a regional sales director, and he led a sales team in a particular region where they provided business support for the North Sales region. From there, he was promoted in his company again to a vice president of companion animal business sales where he was in charge of the whole United States for their sales operation for the companion animal business. And then he moved back into professional or technical services but he left the U.S. business and became the global head of professional services where he then led and coordinated a technical services um, team among the global business and he supported the key opinion leader activities in the international project teams. The next doctor that we're going to look at is Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Hopkins has an M a BMD and an MBA, and she started out as a research assistant, and then she worked as an associate veterinarian. And then she transitioned into industry, just like previous doctors. She started out in technical services. 
Uh, from there, she received some cross-training in her organization, and she moved into regulatory affairs. She started out in a regulatory affairs specialist role where she received some training, and then she was promoted to regulatory affairs manager. She was in charge of new product approvals, product dossier maintenance. She advised manufacturing and marketing and management on the regulatory requirements. From there, she was promoted to the Associate Director of the U.S. Regulatory Affairs Team, and she was in charge of leading a regulatory affairs and quality assurance team due to separation from the larger R&D organization. She then received some cross-training in her company, and she got some experience in marketing, and she became a senior brand manager where she was in charge of managing a $30 million brand. She then moved back over into regulatory affairs, but this time outside of the U.S. She became the Director of Regulatory Affairs for Canada and was also in charge of quality assurance and pharmacovigilance. She was then promoted to the head of the Global Regulatory Affairs Team for Animal Health, where she led the global team of regulatory professionals in supporting the business by registering and maintaining products worldwide. She then moved out of animal health. She stayed with her same company, but she moved over to the consumer health business, where she was the head of the Global Regulatory Affairs for Consumer Health, and she led a team of regulatory professionals to support consumer care products. Um, she also then went back into marketing, where she became a global technical brand manager. And I also want to just right here, I'd like to say, you know, this morning I was talking to the veterinarian who used to be in charge of regulatory affairs and all the scientific um, services for Coca-Cola. Uh, the former head of regulatory, uh, the former head of quality assurance for Campbell's Soup was a veterinarian. Uh, a veterinarian invented uh, the Splenda product that some of you have may, may have used, and a veterinarian invented the Resasis product, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a treatment for dry eyes. So there are veterinarians who have invented a number of things and have worked in a number of different interesting areas in veterinary industry and also outside of the veterinary industry. And I mentioned the specific examples with Coca-Cola and Campbell's Soup. And both of those veterinarians were vice presidents within those organizations. Okay, so next we're going to look at the final resume. This is Dr. Rubin, and Dr. Rubin has a DVM, and he started out his career in private practice. The entry point when he transitioned from practice to industry was just like the two previous doctors. He started out as a professional services veterinarian where he would develop and deliver sales presentations to associations, distribution, and veterinarians. He provided technical support at trade shows, and he was in charge of writing articles. He was then promoted into a leadership role. He was promoted to Director of Field Veterinary Services, where he created and managed a department of field-based veterinarians for sales support. He developed sales presentations, delivered presentations to veterinarians, technicians, and trade organizations, as well as worked with distribution and animal owners, and he interacted with research and development. He then moved into a director of professional services position where he supervised veterinarians and veterinary technicians. He provided technical support of the product line. He handled pharmacovigilance, and he was in charge of tracking and, uh, tracking and reporting product trends to R&D and senior management. He then moved into a director of sales and marketing role where he was responsible for sales. He developed and directed a marketing budget. He supervised the national sales manager, product managers, and national account managers. He, he provided supervision for sales personnel, and he interacted with R&D. From there, he moved into a director of business development role. And remember I said a little while ago that business development is not an entry-level position. It's not a transition from practice to industry. But you can see that Dr. Rubin had a number of years of industry experience. So in his director of business development role, his role was to identify clinical and non-clinical third-party research opportunities, review scientific literature and interact with leading researchers, review and report emerging trends in veterinary practice, identify and, and license new products and technologies, coordinate research and marketing organizations for negotiation of all phases of agreements. From there, he was promoted to an executive vice president where he provided the organization with strategy consulting with regard to infrastructure and sales force, and he provided training in biological and pharmaceutical products, provided input into the research and the development phase. 
So the, uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is transitioning from practice to industry. And, and how do I land a job in industry? Um, and what I wanted to show you in those last slides is how a person could progress within the industry and move up the career ladder once they make that transition. And as you can see, once you successfully make the transition to working in industry, there is plenty of growth opportunity that is available regardless of which of the categories of employment you seek long term. Uh, but we've now gotten to the point in the presentation where we're going to talk about how do I land a job in veterinary industry. And there are five major ways that you should start to go down that path, and I'll address them one at a time. The first thing is that you will need to have a resume, and your resume should include your name, your contact information, and your job history in reverse chronological order. It should also include your skills and experience, any special abilities, honors, and awards and any groups or associations to which you belong. And as far as the length of the resume, it should be no longer than two pages. One page would be too short, and then longer than two pages is too long because most hiring authorities and recruiters are not going to read a resume beyond two pages. Uh, secondly, you need to engage in some networking, which might open some opportunities for you. For instance, you can talk with sales reps who come into your practice or other contacts that you already have in the industry. And thirdly, you should attend industry meetings, talk with exhibitors, and speak with other people in industry who are doing the job that you would like to have. And a good way to approach this would be to invite them to lunch and ask if you can talk with them. Uh, fourth, you need to join the AEIV, the American Association of Industry Veterinarians. And when you become a member, you will be networking with many veterinarians who are working in industry. You can attend their luncheons, their breakfasts, and they typically have uh, meetings at all the major conferences. And then fifth, you should develop a relationship with the recruiter who specializes in the veterinary industry. An important question to ask is when should I establish a relationship with the recruiter? And the answer is long before you need one because you never know when you might need a recruiter and you could be happily employed right now, but who would not want to know about a better opportunity? And the fact of the matter is that your relationship with the recruiter is one of the most critical relationships that you will have as you navigate your career. And that's because recruiters can open doors for you. Recruiters have more contacts with hiring managers than any one person could ever have. And not only that, but some of the most sought after jobs are not posted on the internet. Many of them can only be obtained through a recruiter, especially if it's a confidential search. So we have searches frequently that we cannot post on our website because they're so confidential and we reach out to people uh, that we know that we are aware of that have the qualifications that our client is looking for. I want to talk next about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network with hundreds of millions of members. LinkedIn is a good way to get found by recruiters and employers, and that's because it is used by 98% of recruiters and 48% of recruiters say that they use LinkedIn exclusively. With LinkedIn, you can build both your credibility and your own personal brand. And one way to do that is to get recommendations from current and former colleagues who can recommend you on LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is a great tool, but you should not rely on it exclusively, and that's because nothing can replace the value of face-to-face -face networking and having a good rec recruiter to partner with you throughout your career. At this point, I'd like to address a few things to consider when making a transition from practice to industry. When you make a transition from practice to industry, there's a good chance that you're going to be part of a larger organization. The industry jobs require the ability to work within the structure of a larger organization where there are typically many policies and procedures. And as a result, there can be a great deal of bureaucracy associated with working for a larger company. And that's why previous organizational and interpersonal skills are a definite plus. Another thing to consider is that there will be performance reviews. When you work in industry, you will be evaluated annually for your performance. As part of that, you will set goals with your manager each year, and some of your compensation will likely be based on whether or not you meet those performance goals. And not only that, but your performance review is typically tied to a bonus or a merit increase. 
Another part of working in industry is corporate culture. Corporate culture is critical because you need to be able to deal with uncertainty such as cultural changes or mergers and acquisitions, which can lead to decreased jobs or new opportunities. And as a result, you must remain flexible and keep your options open. Another thing to consider is mobility. And when I say mobility, I'm talking primarily about relocation. In order to work in industry, you may have to move to the city where the job is located. Don't turn down a job just because it's located in another city, and don't turn it down because it's not 100% the ideal job you would like to have right now. You have to be willing to get your foot in the door. And once you have industry experience, your options will become better and your opportunities will increase. And keep in mind that some companies will cross-train their employees. It's at this point in our presentation where I'm going to hand off the webinar to our special guest, Dr. Karen Felstead with Panthera T Consulting. Thank you, Stacy. Are the slides showing there? Yes. Excellent, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to be here. I hope you're um, getting some useful information out of this because uh, industry is a very interesting um, alternative to private practice. And some people have known that they always want to be in industry. Some try private practice for a while, enjoy it, but it's just time for, uh, for something new. And I think Stacey's done a great job here of going through and talking about all of those alternatives. So I want to talk briefly about the outlook for industry veterinarians. Um, the ADMA did a workforce study a number of years ago, and when they released that study in 2012, they said, you know, pretty much the industry positions are in equilibrium. Um, as many jobs as are out there, there are the same number of people who want those jobs. They estimated a 3.75% average growth rate between 2008 and 2016, which of course would be this year, and then a slow growth rate between 2017 and 2025. And that's one of the things I want to touch on. Um, getting an industry job is more competitive now than it, than it used to be. A certain amount of that is because of the amazing amount of consolidation that we're seeing between industry companies. And so when two companies merge, they generally have fewer jobs than if you just added together the number of the jobs in the, the two companies before they merged. Now, one thing you're seeing is that you're seeing more little startup companies within the veterinary industry, the pharmaceutical industry, or other products related to veterinary medicine. So some of those startup companies, which we don't often think of as traditional industry, are employing veterinarians. So some of the, um, the job loss is offset by that. We also have more veterinarians in the field than we used to. And we also have more people who, are, who currently are in private practice or who have been in private practice show an interest in industry. And so without a doubt, it's a more competitive market than it used to be. And so this isn't meant to discourage you from looking at industry. You should. But you also want to do everything that you can to prepare yourself for it. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit here in this, this first section of the two sections that I'm going to cover. So when we talk about job responsibilities, and this list was put together by Stacy Pritt, and she did a survey of a, a large number of people in industry to try and identify what are the things that you do every day. People management was a big issue, budget and finance management, sales, consulting, uh, writing, developing business strategy, marketing, teaching, and program and project management. And actually that program and project management was the responsibility that I got the most answers for. So I think it's pretty clear that that's something that you would have to do no matter what your job is in industry. When Stacy asked these individuals, what are the skills you need for success, you can see that list here. And of course, one of the things that's at the top of the list is managing people and human resources. And Stacey has talked about the need for um, good communication skills, good ability to get along with people, and that's going to be important in almost every industry job. Finance, accounting, and budgeting, that's not as, as common a skill that's really needed. 
But if you're going to have any kind of a supervisory role, there's a good chance you're going to have to deal with finances one way or another. You may be responsible for a budget. You're certainly going to be responsible for meeting your own goals. But nobody's expecting you to be a, a CPA there. Written communication and oral communication skills are absolutely critical in every single job out there. And in fact, those were the two skills that were most commonly mentioned as being necessary for success. Delivering sales proposals, obviously if you're a salesperson, that's going to be important. Facility management, that's only going to be important to those who have that particular kind of a job. Project management, again, that was a, a skill that came up very frequently as being necessary for success. And then leading teams and participating in teams. And of course, that comes back to good interpersonal skills, good communication. I picked out the top five of these because what I want to talk about is how do you transition from private practice into industry and how can you develop some of these skills. So one of them was obviously oral and written communication, employee management, business knowledge, computer literacy, leadership, flexible attitude and a team player approach, and program and project management. When we think about veterinarians that are currently in private practice, all of you are currently involved in the medical aspect of veterinary medicine. You're, you're working with clients, you're preventing disease, you're diagnosing disease, you're treating animals, you're using your medical and surgical knowledge and skills. Some of you, depending on what your role is in a practice, may have administrative and managerial skills. So you, you, uh, you, you supervise employees. Everybody has client communication. You may have some role in clinic management. You're involved in the marketing, or you're involved in the scheduling, or you're involved in the ordering. And a few of you may have some financial um, skills as well, or some financial experience in a practice, particularly if you're a practice owner and you're interested in selling your, your practice and moving into industry, you've probably had some, some financial experience. All of these things can be very, very helpful in finding that job in industry. If you don't have a ton of these skills, though, there are ways to develop that. So one of the things you can do is get more education. And that can be formal education or informal education. It's a little bit easier to document formal education and to persuade a, a hiring manager that you have it. So certainly attendance at veterinary conferences, attendance at webinars, um, going back and getting another degree, so it's a, possibly an MBA, or Stacy talked about the need for um, a master's or a PhD if you're going into um, research and development. But certainly reading and then being able to communicate to a hiring manager that you're wide read in certain subjects can be helpful as well. Volunteer work can give you a skill set. If you manage the budget for a small nonprofit in your area, you've got some demonstrated skills in, in that category. Speaking and media interviews, so while you've been working in practice, you may have given presentations to veterinary groups in the area. You may have done some of the training within the practice, so you've done formal presentations at staff meetings. You may have been responsible for interviews when the media needs information. And you may have done some writing as well. So all of those skills and all of that experience can translate very, very well into industry. So let's talk a little bit more about oral communication. And if you say, well, you know, I don't really have a ton of those skills, you can think about ways to develop them. Now, you certainly should have some oral communication skills because you talk, most of you talk with clients every day. And if you don't feel that that's something that you do as well, then you want to get some training in it. And certainly, if you go to veterinary conferences across the United States, communication is an area that there is almost always some kind of, of seminars available on, and I'd highly encourage you to take that. We tend to think that um, communication skills are innate, that people are born with them or not, but in reality, communication skills can be learned. So that is definitely something that you can improve on. Once you have a reasonable amount of confidence, you want to be able to move a little bit more into public speaking. So you give talks at local club meetings, and this may be related to veterinary medicine, or it may be related to something you do outside of veterinary medicine, or you can offer to speak at, at veterinary meetings. I mean, the very first meetings that, that I spoke at before I was speaking at, at national and international meetings were small manager groups. There might have been six people there, but I still had to get up, put together a presentation, get over the, the nerves that you're going to have the first few times you do those talks. 
Toastmasters is a great organization that will give you formal training in how to speak more confidently. Everybody I know that's gone through Toastmasters has nothing but, but good things to say about it. And of course, you want to make sure that you're keeping track of these things. Um, don't just say, oh, I'll put together that list later, because you know it might be 10 years before you start thinking about industry or have need for those, but you want to be able to show that every year or every month or whatever it is, here's the kinds of, of seminars that you've given, the kind of speaking engagements you've had. Written communication skills, and again, it means writing articles, and that can be for a local organization that you're part of, may not have anything to do with veterinary medicine. It may be your clinic newsletter, it may be a magazine within veterinary medicine or in some other field that you're interested in. Um, you may be help write the handouts that you use in your practice, so practice publications. To some extent, it doesn't matter what you're writing, you just need practice and experience in writing professional good quality good quality publications. If writing is something that you're not comfortable with, take a course in it. And there's online courses, there's courses at community colleges, but that can give you a very valuable skill set. Managing employees, not everybody is automatically a good employee manager. Not everybody likes it. It's a it's a tough role. But if you can get your feet wet, if you can get some experience, that's a skill that you can then demonstrate to a hiring manager. So offer to take on formal responsibilities at your practice. So maybe um, you can be the person that manages the technicians or manages the receptionist if your practice doesn't have a head technician or a head receptionist. You can involve yourself informally. So um, you can offer to mediate disputes between technicians. You can offer to organize staff meetings. And it, even small activities give you some feel for what it's like to have to, to do that and give you some experience that you can talk about when you're, you're interviewing. And of course, formal education, attending seminars on employee management, reading publications, taking on responsibilities in, in organizations you're a part of outside of veterinary medicine, all of that counts as well when you're looking at experience in managing employees. Business knowledge, and this is a fairly, um, broad topic, but you want to start thinking about veterinary medicine, not just your practice, but the company that you want to work for in a, in a business way. So it's not just about taking care of animals, but how do you run the business and make it possible to provide that great client service and that great medicine. And so specifically, this is going to be things like managing a budget, marketing, um, and this this means paying attention in everything that you do to the business aspects of it. And again, that can be um, a nonprofit organization that you're a part of, a school organization that you're part of, something that you do outside of veterinary medicine. Computer literacy is critical. Um, the basics are going to be Microsoft Office, so Word, Excel, Outlook, PowerPoint. If you don't know how to use those programs, um, definitely you can take an online course on it. There are courses, live courses, as well as in communities. You need to be able to do basic and advanced internet search, uh, searches. You want to be able to use programs like GoToWebinar that we're on now, GoToMeeting, um, Yahoo and Google Groups, Skype. Practice management software, if you're going to be in and out of practices as a technical services veterinarian or a sales rep, Understanding the different kinds of practice management software is, is very helpful. And of course, consumer customer communication, so Facebook, Twitter, others. And this is a very easy category to get some, some knowledge in and some experience in. Leadership skills, this can be a little bit tougher, but take on a role in a veterinary association or a civic group. They would all love to have you volunteer to do that. Most groups are, are dying to have people be a part of it. And that can give you some very valuable skills. Focus on time management. Toastmasters, again, can help with this. Some people hire a business coach if they feel they need some advice or expertise on this. And of course, taking some formal courses on leadership as well. Stacy talked about the flexible attitude that's needed as a part of being um, in industry, and I think this is very critical to, to reinforce. You have to be willing to adapt to the employer's changing needs. Your job may change if their needs change. That is probably more likely to happen in industry than in veterinary medicine, so sometimes that can be a, a more difficult adaptation. You've got to be willing to continually learn things. If you're not a, a, a lifetime learner, you're going to be stalled in an industry job. It, you may come across as not being somebody they want to hire, but also 
your, your, your promotions aren't going to come. So you want to track your learning efforts. You want to talk to potential employers about those efforts. And you've got to be able to participate in and lead teams. And often industry means being more involved in a team than practice does. Because granted, we're, we're all in teams in practice, but still it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the client and making that diagnosis and, and treatment plan for the pet. You won't get to make the final decision in many cases. In practice, you make the final decision about what treatment is going to be necessary for that pet. That may not happen in industry. You've got to be able to work with, though, and support people and projects that wouldn't be your first choice. And, and learn how to manage expressing your opinion, but not necessarily running all over people or, or being mad if it doesn't go the way that you want it to. Program and project management, this is kind of a general category, but it means time management skills. It means employee management skills. It means learning how to delegate and, and delegate effectively. It means budget skills. So any project experience you can get in the practice, so maybe it's putting together a new marketing program, and that's going to be updating the website and Facebook. Or it's um, something that you do with another organization, so you organize a community fair for an animal-related organization that you're a part of. But even small projects that, you know, you think about them and you go, well, I just do this as, as part of my contribution, can show that you have this kind of skills and expertise. So I want to wrap up here by talking briefly about what the market looks like. Um, probably no surprise that when we look at the number of veterinarians out there and what they do, the vast majority are in private practice. Industry is a, is a pretty small part of that. And as we've talked about, industry is getting a little bit more competitive. But there are certainly jobs out there, and if this is a passion for you, you should definitely take a stab at, at finding that specific job. Industry can be lucrative. You can do very well here. The average earnings for veterinarians in industry is about 169,000, whereas the average earnings for veterinarians in private practice is about 94. Now, in both of those categories, private practice and industry, there's a pretty broad spread, and there are certainly many veterinarians in private practice who who do much better than the average 94,000. Most of the time, those are going to be owners, and so. Uh, if you're interested in increasing your earnings in private practice, you definitely want to look at ownership. If you say, no, that's not for me, industry can also provide you with a lucrative career. And there are certainly people in industry that do much better than that, that, that median number that I showed you. So the 90th percentile is 286,000. So after you've been there a while, I mean, those are not obviously entry-level salaries, but after you've been there a while, you've moved up the ranks, you've moved around, like Stacey showed some of those job pro progressions, that kind of salary is available to some veterinarians. And even if you don't make it to the 90th percentile, the 75th percentile is about 220. So there's definitely an opportunity to make more money. If we talk specifically about some of the positions that Stacey has talked about, um, professional services or technical tech services veterinarians, runs anywhere between 65 and 125,000. Often there's a base salary. Um, you'll have some kind of a target that you're aiming to achieve and you get extra compensation if you do. And you need to remember too that there can be some benefits you wouldn't typically have in practice that reduce your, your cost. So that kind of counts as, as salary too. So a car allowance, a company car. Um, the, the pay for veterinarians in this category can vary a lot with the type of company. So capital equipment companies tend to be less than pharmaceutical companies. If you're a board certified specialist and you're a specialty account veterinarian, that's going to be a higher salary than one typically paid to uh, uh, somebody with a, a general degree. Pharmacovigilance, 90,000 to 120. Regulatory, very wide range from 75,000 to 200. And of course, that's going to be um, you know, the lower level jobs, which would probably be the first place you would go if you're entering pharmacovigilance up to um, a director or VP type position. Marketing jobs, somewhere between 90 and 135. But again, if you're up at the director or VP level, those go up to 175, 250. So um, the position that you have obviously drives salary. The size and type of the company, sometimes geography can influence salary as well. And of course, earnings increase with the more with more skills, knowledge, experience that you bring to the job. So usually, the longer you've been out 
from school, the higher your salary is going to be. But that's not just because of seniority. Usually that means that you're bringing more to the position. Board certification can help. Advanced degrees can help. So an MBA, um, a PhD if you're interested in research and development. Certainly performance. I mean, within any job category in industry, there are people that do very, very well at it, and others that are just kind of marking time. So if you're a high performer, you're going to make more money. And then, of course, gathering additional skills, not just to get that first job in industry, but the, the training that industry provides and trying different skills. I mean, what was so interesting to me about those resumes that Stacy showed is how people move around amongst various divisions in a company, but ultimately end up at a very high level because they demonstrated not only a, uh, an interest in trying different things, but they've done well at it. So getting those promotions is going to increase your, your earnings as well. In general, and these, these two slides here show the percentage of veterinarians that get benefits both in industry versus private practice. Um, in general, industry benefits are better. You get more benefits and the benefits are richer. Even if it's a benefit that both industry and private practice offers, it's usually a better benefit within industry. So when you're looking at salaries, you don't want to forget to also look at the, the benefit side of it because that can, can be very lucrative as well. Hours work, most people say that they work more hours when they're in industry. When you look at the published numbers, and this comes from the 2015 AVMA report on veterinary compensation, that's four now. So the mean, which is the yellow bar in industry, is about 49.6 hours a week. It's about 47.9 hours in private practice. The median, you see a, a slightly bigger difference. It's about 50 hours a week in industry and about 45 in private practice. So no question you have to be prepared for the fact that you may work a few more hours in addition to some of the things that um, Stacy talked about, so the mobility and the travel um, and the working is a part of a, a harder, a harder, or bigger I should say, um, organization. And that can be a harder transition when you're used to working in a business that has 10 people and now you're working in a business that has 2,000. So I'm going to turn this back to Stacy to give you a few resources that you'll find very useful if you're making this transaction or transition, I should say. And we're also happy to answer questions at the end. If you have any, be sure and submit those. Yes. Karen, can you uh, see my screen again? Yes, but you're at 545, so yeah, yeah, you want to advance. Yeah, I had to change that somehow into the back over there. Okay, so um, okay. All right, so as we've been talking throughout this webinar, there are a number of opportunities in veterinary industry. There will continue to be opportunities within veterinary industry. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the webinar consisted of three main sections. We've talked about the types of jobs that are available in industry, the qualifications that are needed for these jobs, how you can transition from private practice into the corporate world. In examining these three main sections of content, we had two main objectives in the webinar. The first was to describe the skills needed to transition from private practice to the corporate environment. The second was to explore the opportunities currently available outside of traditional clinical practice. And before we close today's presentation, I would like to highlight a number of helpful websites that you can visit, many of which we referenced earlier. Uh, so AAIV, the American Association of Industry Veterinarians, um, the vetrecruiter.com, Animal Health Careers, and Animal Health jobs. And then there is Karen and my contact information. Um, I also wanted to say we, we didn't have any questions, but we did have a industry veterinarian on the call who said that, and Karen, you may have touched on this too, but to develop communication skills, she said offer to teach a community education class. I thought that was a very good suggestion, um, but feel free to reach out to Karen and I, Karen or I, after today's webinar. If you are in private practice and you'd love to make a transition to industry, I would 
encourage you um, to contact us, and, and both of our contact information is here on the screen. Uh, the veterinary industry is a great industry in which to work. This is an exciting time to be a part of it, and I hope the information that we provided today was both valuable to you and that it will help you as you continue to grow and navigate your career. On behalf of myself and Dr. Felstead, I would like to thank you for joining us today for our special webinar, and please contact us again with any questions, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.